right, you ready for the word? Yes. All right, let's get our Bibles and let's open them to Acts chapter 18. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and we will get one to you. Acts chapter 18. All right, see a few hands out there. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time to set apart from a cup of coffee life at times, Lord, the busyness. May we now be about your business, Lord, your word, your will, and your way. And so create in us right now clean hearts, renew in us right spirits, meaning give us minds and hearts that aren't clogged by all the things of this world. Lord, give us the remembrance to be still and know that you're God. Lord, as we see Paul today, may we see your presence and knowing that as, as you were with him, Lord, you are with us. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So encourage us where we need encouragement, Lord. Convict, convict us, Lord, where we need conviction, God. Comfort us where we need comfort. So, Spirit living God, I pray now that I and all of us would decrease and you would fall on us now. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Okay. Well, if you remember, last time we were here last week, we were recognizing that Paul leaves the city of Athens, which is all about intelligentsia, and he moves to Corinth, and Corinth is all about what? It, it is an absolute debauchery, okay? It is Sin City. It is Vegas on steroids. A thousand naked temple prostitutes right in the middle of town. So that means you're just trying to go to Walmart, and you have to go past this. This is what's going on in this community. But what does Paul do when he sees this city? He does what he's called to do. A sower goes out to? So, and so he just grabs his Jesus loves you bumper sticker and goes. Okay, so he's out there, Jesus is Lord, and he begins to sow. And we recognize that it's our kuleana to sow. It's God's kuleana on what happens to that seed. But notice, what did we see last week? Three things. First of all, when he goes to that city, he meets Priscilla and Aquila. How does he meet them? He meets them by trade. It's because they have the same profession. And so we talked about the idea of ministry in the marketplace. It's nothing new. There are wonderful books out there to help you understand that you are a missionary when you go to work. Remember, a missionary isn't someone who crosses the sea, but somebody who? who sees the cross. And so maybe this little book might be helpful for you. We have some up there in the front. But the whole idea is, is that ministry isn't just going to the octa people. It isn't just what you do in a church program or feeding the homeless. Ministry is where you work and where you live. Amen? Let me give you a fun example. Just last night, someone was sharing with me after the message a story. We went to Israel, as you know, and we came back. We go to the Valley of Elah, which is where David fought with Goliath. And so I always take everybody there and give them the chance to go grab their five smooth stones and represent that the five stones for us is going in the morning to our quiet time because we don't know what giants we're going to have to face during the day. And so God, I want to be prepared. So whatever giants you bring before me, I, I have within me that which you've asked me to be prepared for. And so we grabbed some stones for someone who was not on the trip. So we brought them to her. So now she takes them, goes to work. She works at the Capitol. She works in one of the high offices in the Capitol. She has a little dish there and she puts these five smooth stones on her desk. She has an empty desk except a, a little dish of rocks. And one of the capital people walk by and go, are those rocks? She goes, yeah. He goes, where are they from? She goes, listen, the Valley of Elah. And he's like, okay. And walks away, you're like, trying to act like he knew what that was. He comes by a little bit later on. So where's that Valley of Elah? She goes, it's in Israel. He goes, oh, okay. And he walks on. And then she comes back. Is this so fun how the human mind works? She could just see that his mind was going. So sure enough, before lunch, she comes back and he goes, so what do those rocks do? <laughs> so how I and I, you know, thinking about the mana and the power and all that stuff. So what do those rocks do? And it was so awesome because she's like, well, it's not what the rocks do. It what reminds me about, and she tells him the whole story about David and Goliath and God being large and but five rocks on her desk. Ministry in the marketplace, amen? And being able to teach and bring up, the guy asked, and here's the opportunity to share that. So that's what we have the privilege of doing like Paul did with Aquila and Priscilla. Then we notice he did, as is his custom, he goes into the synagogue, he shares the word of God, but did they receive? No, they rejected. So where did Paul go? 
next door. And Christian, it is so important. Listen, we can so often get our pride in our evangelism. What I mean, somebody at work just wants to argue. They want this or that. Well, how come you this? And if you did this, well, I saw this on the internet. And they want to go through all this stuff. And right in the next cubicle is a person that says, there's got to be more to life than this. I don't even know if I want to see next Monday. See, sometimes all we need to do is move next door. These folks, listen, if they just want to battle, mm, God doesn't need to be defended. He wants to be released. And sometimes we just need to say, Lord, is there soil here that is open? So Paul just moves next door. Huge harvest. He throws his seed there, and it's good soil. Not, Not only did those folks come get saved, but the actual synagogue leader going to work every day sees the salvation, the transformation, and so he becomes a believer, we saw. What an amazing thing. But the third thing we saw last week, which is so amazing, that regardless of all this incredible fruit, Paul still needed to be encouraged. And you know, church, I just want to encourage you to encourage the pastors and leaders and Sunday school teachers in this church. It's so nice just to hear, I appreciate you. You're doing a great job. Lives are being changed by what you do. This is the Apostle Paul. And he found himself feeling like he was alone. And that brought fright. That brought fear. And so though he had fear, what God needed to remind him is he had something greater than fear. He had his presence. Look with me at verse 9 of chapter 18 of Acts. He says, And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid. What? Wow. So that means he had been fearing. Don't be afraid any longer, but go on speaking and don't be silent, for I am what? Oh, see, the issue is either there is the fright or the fact that I am with you. Now, look at me, please, family. Let me explain what's going on in Hawaii right now. Right now, we have all this anger and haboot and people asking for heads of the poor person who clicked the wrong button last week. What a difference a week makes, by the way. Why are people so venomous, so angry? You see this session done at the Capitol where they're, well, we want somebody who fired and so on and so forth. Can I explain it to you? I've had, told this to so many people in the last week and I just see their heads going, huh. If you've ever watched those shows where they, free, where they scare people, you know, for some funny home videos or whatever, and the guy comes around in a full monkey suit and goes, Rah! and the guy goes, ah! you know, what do they do right after they completely freak out? They get angry. They get angry. You see them like, ah! And like, ah! See, you get angry when you've been stripped of all of your self-control. That shame, that embarrassment of completely being removed of your sense of control, then the natural response to that shame, that embarrassment, is to cover it by anger and rage. That's what's happening. Because you see, folks, the fear comes in, but the question is, what was deeper in your heart, Jesus Christ or the fear? So if the fear went deeper than what you've allowed Jesus, then you've got now this reaction, this response of like, ugh. See, Paul was just reminded, yeah, Paul, you got fear, but you know what's deeper? Me. How deep the Father's love we sing. Have you allowed Christ to become all so that you know you can say, Lord, whether I live or whether I die, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Paul was just reminded, hey, brother, you've got the most important thing, and that is my presence. So now we're going to see Paul taking that promise of God and stepping out and stepping up into some amazing things. So join me now at verse 11, and it says, after that encouragement, and he settled there for a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. But while Gallio was proconsul in Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying... This man persuades men to worship God. Notice, contrary to the law. Now, I want to ask you a question. What law? Okay, these are Jews that are speaking before a Roman judge, this this proconsul, and they're saying that this guy is breaking the law. What's going on here? First of all, these unbelieving Jews, these religious zealot Jews, are not giving up on Paul. They continue continue to pursue him. Look back at verse 6. Remember last week when he goes to the synagogue, it says, and they resisted and they blasphemed. And what did Paul do? He shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own hands. I'm, I'm clean. 
Paul says, hey, I came to share with you the gospel, but we see their reaction was completely antagonistic, and that happens at times. So they are coming after Paul, and so they drag him before the judgment seat. Now, Christian, listen, here's something fun for you. When you hear the word judgment seat, have you ever heard the word bema? We talk about that, you hear that a lot in Revelation before the bema seat. The word bema is the word judgment. They brought him before the bema. This is the exact place. This is in Corinth. This is the bema. This is the judgment seat. Zoom in on the next photo, please. So you can see right there in Greek, the word bema. This is the very place where Galileo was standing, Paul was standing, go back to the other photo, Paul was standing right before this post. What is that post? Well, if you remember the Passion of Christ, when Jesus was being held against a post and they were whipping him, that's exactly what that is. Had this story gone differently than we're going to hear in a moment, that's the exact post that Paul would have been stripped to and beaten with the whip. This is the very place. It's the bema, the judgment seat, the place of proclamation. Now, why is Paul there? Well, it tells us that these zealot, these unbelieving Jews, they united in court, and it says here, they came in one accord against Paul. So they, they all get into one car, and they drive there, because they're in one accord, and they're like, yeah, man, oh, okay, no, and that's not what it means? All right, okay. So listen, the thing that I want us to understand is this. Sometimes the only things folks can agree on is that they don't like you. Amen? That's sometimes the only thing they can agree upon. Think about it. There is a saying in Israel that if you ever have two Jews, you have four opinions. It's true. Let's look at the Arab nations. The only thing they can agree upon is that they hate the Jew. Okay, the Sunnis are killing the Shiites and bombs and blooms and all these different things. All this stuff, every nation fighting against each other. But you get them together, you say, oh, but the Jew. And then they'll rally up and have this incredible raging war, the Six-Day War, all these different things that take place. See, the enemy will constantly want to drive us together by finding some common goal of hatred that we can pull together. And that's what's happening to Paul. They rallied together for this. But what is their plan? Well, it says Gallio now becomes the new proconsul. So... There's a new sheriff in town. So the leader in the synagogue goes, hey, I have an idea. Let's take Paul before the court and accuse him of breaking the law. What law? Not Christian law like you might think, not Jewish law like you might think. They're accusing Paul of breaking Roman law. Why? Because of this right here. This sentence here, religio illicita. Religio illicita was the law that said all religions practiced in Rome must be state certified. The state must know about this religion and agree to this religion. Judaism had already been accepted. When Rome conquered Israel, they said, we will recognize your religion and your freedom to practice this. So now this synagogue and these religious zealots are saying, oh, Paul is teaching this new religion and maybe we can get him thrown out of town or even worse. And so they bring Paul before the proconsul with this reason to accuse him of breaking Roman law. Verse 14, but... When Paul was about to open his mouth, I love this, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of a wrong or vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to speak with you. But if there are questions about words and names and what does it say? Your own law, look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge in these matters. And he drove them away from the Bema. Now, Christian, listen how powerful this is. As they come with this accusation, hey, this guy's bringing a new religion. What does Gallio do? He says, I don't see this as a different religion, but a different form of your Judaism. Therefore, it's not to be settled in Roman court. Now, we are excited, ecstatic about God's hand here. Here's Paul getting dragged one more time, brought before a court one more time, but God is large and because what you don't realize, how important this decision is. Gallio is a Roman proconsul. They have the same as we do, law precedent. So when this Roman proconsul said, listen, this guy isn't teaching a new thing, it's just a form of your thing, believe it or not, Roman law just validated Christianity. Isn't that amazing? So that means whenever they were in Ephesus, whenever they would be in Corinth, when they would be in Thessalonica, any place that Paul would now begin a church, no one could say these guys are kicked out because they were part of what we call ourselves today Judeo-Christianity. 
Old Testament, New Testament, one author. Amen? So here is, again, they're planning to, des- to destroy him, and instead God uses it now to legitimize Christianity in the eyes of Rome. Wow. Verse 17. And after this verdict, it says, And they all took Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment scene. Check this out. And Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. He so disdained the Jews, they take the leader, they start beating him. He's like, yeah, whatever. He go eats his poke. You know, I'm out of here. Just let them do their thing. Brother, is just getting beat up. Now, listen, this is what's so amazing. It says here, and they took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue. Now, somebody might be able to scratch their head and go, wait a minute, pastor. Didn't we just learn last week that the leader of the synagogue was named Crispus? Look up at verse 8. And what happened to Crispus? It says in verse 8, and Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all of his household, as I mentioned earlier. And many of the Corinthians, when they heard, they were believing and being baptized. So why do we, do we have a contradiction here? Once it says Christmas, and now it says Sosthenes. Which one is it? The answer is yes. Because obviously the synagogue is not going to have a born-again believer as their leader. So once he has given his life over to Jesus Christ, saying Yeshua HaMashiach, they replace him with the new leader, which is Sosthenes. Sosthenes now says, hey, I got a plan, a way to rise me up in respect with all of these uh, Jewish zealot leaders. Let's get rid of this guy. My plan is let's take him before Roman court and accuse him of this. What happens? His plan completely backfires. Because now he is the one getting the beating, not Paul. Why? Because the Jewish leaders are now irate over the fact that they have now been put in bad form in front of the new proconsul. Interesting. The Bible says that we shall reap what we sow. You see, folks, here is why. Listen to me. This is why I'm so excited on the way I see God working here. Paul getting taken to court, and yet God legitimizes. God takes his accuser and deals with him. This is why Paul lived what he taught. And I see it here again and again. He sees the hand of God. Look overhead in Romans 12. Paul writes this. Why? Because of what you just saw. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with it all, man. I mean, you do your part, but it's not always going to be about you. Then he says, never take your own revenge, beloved. But what? Leave room what? Okay, let me have your attention. Christians. Do we leave room for the wrath of God? When somebody goes on Facebook, oh yeah, is that leaving room for the face of God? When somebody starts accusing you of this, oh yeah, and you want to come back and you, you see, the problem is we see so little miracles because we are playing God and not making room for God. When Daniel and the boys get taken to Babylon and they say, hey, you got to eat the king's food. He's like, you know what? That's not kosher for us. So tell you what. Let's do one week. You let us eat our food. And then in one week, he made room for a miracle. And the miracle took place. See, the Bible says, don't you run and defend yourself. But why do we do so so quickly? Because we are so concerned what people think rather than what God thinks. God says, let me be large and Are we making room for a miracle? He says, leave room for the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. Okay, who's saying that? God. Okay, are you God? No. Okay. Vengeance is mine, not my husband, not my wife, not my kid, okay, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, do what? Feed him. him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. So in so doing, you'll be burning hot coals upon him. And as I shared with the group last night, listen, congregation, we got a real practical thing here. Right next to us is a business called Ideas. It used to be Jellies and now it's business. The owner of that business really, really, really doesn't like us. Why? Well, because our people tend to take parking for his business. And people come through. And so when we try to say, hey, he just doesn't even look. He's like, ugh. When we have to block off the things on Saturday nights because the events are coming through, we're asking, hey, where are you going? And so they, hey, we want to go into the ideas. Okay, great. We let him in. But in his mind, his idea is, hey, you know what? You guys are even blocking people from coming into my business. Not true. And so here he is all haboot with us. Now, I could go, oh, bro, you think that I'll watch what I can do to you? Or I could go, hey, we're just doing what the policy says. The policy says on events, blah, blah, blah. I could try to defend, but it said, you know what I want you to do? I want you all to go on ideas and buy something. It says right here, right here, right here. Check it out, check it out. 
It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If his, bur- if his business is hurting, give him dollar. <laughs> we just love him in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen? This is what it looks like. You see, Paul, Paul was very, very familiar with Isaiah 54, that no weapon formed against you will prosper. He sees these guys coming at him, and every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their vindication is where? From me. It's not me trying to vindicate myself. I make room for my God to work in my life. You see, this is what's so great. Now, let me show you the best part. You ready for the best part? Yes. Okay, this is the best part. In 1 Corinthians, first what? Corinthians. Corinthians, written to where? Corinth. Where is Paul right now? Corinth. Corinth. In 1 Corinthians, when Paul later writes this letter, 1 Corinthians 1.1. 1, 1. You've never noticed this before because you never put Acts and Corinthians side by side. It says this, Paul, called an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, brother to the church of God, which is in Corinth. Whoa. How awesome is that? The very guy who becomes his accuser gets born again, gets saved. And he says, now Sosthenes, my brother says, how's that? (laughs) Wow. Now you know why Paul can write over and over and over in Romans 8. And we, what's that word? And we know, I know that I know that I know that God causes all things to work together. Men, we were almost kicked out and said that we were a dirty new belief. Now we got legitimized as Judeo-Christian. The very guy that accuses me is now supporting and coming alongside me in ministry. God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Is that you? And those who are called according to his purpose. See, listen to me. Folks, like Sosthenes, some people will never come to Jesus Christ until they get a beating. Some of you are in this room, so hot head, I'm not gonna ask you to raise hands, but it took God stripping you of this and stripping this away and the business going away and the marriage falling apart and this and all this empire that you thought, but it wasn't until you got a beating. See, sometimes it's the only way that God can finally use to help us finally see our need for a God. See, every self-made person worships their creator. So you got the job because you're so smart, because you did your studies, and your health, your body is good because you jog and all these, never realizing that everything is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. And so God says, well, there is an idolatry. You think you're God, so let me just show you what it looks like. And he strips and removes everything. And what I want to let you know, family, right now, and that is you, like Sosthenes, allow the beating right now to draw you to Jesus, not from Jesus. He wants you to know that he loves you. And sometimes he needs to allow all the things in our lives to be stripped away. See, Paul now says in verse 18, And Paul, having now remained many days longer, he took leave of the brethren. And he put out to sea. You notice they traveled by sea because it was safer and cheaper and quicker to go that way. So he heads out towards Syria. And with him now are who? Priscilla and Aquila. Now, interesting. Evidently, Silas and Timothy now who came down to Corinth are now going to remain and they're going to oversee the new churches that are happening there. But Aquila and Priscilla, they're going to go with them. Why? Remember, they were there for the Isthmus in games. They were making tents for all the tailgaters that were there. Well, now that the games, the Olympics are over, the need for them to be there begins to just diminish. And so now Paul says, hey, I'm going to Ephesus. And they say, great, we'll go too. But now let me show you something also that I think is pretty exciting. Check this out. In the beginning, Paul worked for Aquila and Priscilla as he sewed tents. But as he does so, Paul worked on Aquila and Priscilla by giving them the gospel. He first comes and works for them. And now he's able to, now he's working for them. Now he begins to work on them and tell them about the hope and the joy that is within him. And now as the byproduct, he now works with Aquila and Priscilla as they head for Ephesus together. Isn't that awesome? Talk about taking your next steps. So I want you to see this. Paul worked for. Who do you work for? And as you work for them, are you working 
on them as an opportunity to share the love of Jesus that has set you free? Because the byproduct is, is God has a plan for all of us, a plan to prosper, not to harm. And we could be working with one another now, working with these folks to share with others the awesome things of God. Amen. Amen. Taking those next steps, one step at a time. Now, here's something interesting. Verse 18 ends with this. So he gets in a boat, he goes with Priscilla and Aquila, and then Paul says, and then Luke says this. And then Centuria, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Now, you really want to read that and go, really? Was that really important to write down, or he got his hair cut? I mean, you can only have 35 feet on a scroll. Is that important? Oh, you know what Paul did? He got his hair cut. <laughs> Fabulous. You know what happened the other day? Paul got his hair cut. Why would he say that? Because this is specific for the Jewish reader. This is specific for the Jewish leader. You see, one thing you have to understand, here he is in the Corinth, Ephesus area. As he leaves this area, Centuria, it's a main port. Let me tell you about this port. It had temples too, Isis, Artemis, Aphrodite, Eclipius, and Poseidon. This is a very, very pagan area. But what is Paul doing? He's living out a very Jewish custom, a very Jewish practice. See, we don't know when Paul began this vow, but these vows are called Nazarite vows. In Numbers chapter 6, we know the rules. And when you're under a Nazarite vow, you're not supposed to eat certain foods, drink certain drinks, as well as not cut your hair. That's what I used to always tell my mom in the 70s when I had long hair, and she said I should cut it. It's biblical. (laughs) Taking a Nazarite vow, mom. Jesus had long hair. You know, I said that to my dad once. You know what he said? He said, yeah, Jesus walked everywhere, so give me the car keys. (laughs) (sighs) Yeah, it stinks having a smart dad. Okay, folks, what is my point? Here's Paul. The guy that we love to quote in Galatians who was the preacher of freedom, the preacher of grace. The preacher of grace is the one living out a Jewish custom, a Jewish practice. Why why would he be doing that? Well, he told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and to the Jews I became as a Jew. I practiced Jewish things that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though myself, I'm not under the law, I don't have to, but I do so that I might win those who are under the law. Verse 21, to those who are without the law, as without the law, though not myself not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ. I don't just go drink and partying so I can say, here, I can reach my friends. No, and so around the Jewish people, I will keep my Jewish customs and my Jewish world. And when I'm with the non-believers, I will also find the point of identity. Why does he do these things? Verse 22, to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men that I might by all means do what? save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel. That's why I do it, for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. He says, I'm a Jewish man, so I will keep Jewish things and make that as a window, an opportunity to be able to relate with my Jewish friends so that I can share with them the gospel. When I'm with the Gentiles, I don't have to worry about those things, and I can relate to them and minister to them. And when it says, to the weak I became weak, would you please hear me? Because I think sometimes one of the mistakes we have in Christendom is what I call spiritual arrogance, spiritual pride. Sometimes in our journey with Christ, we have a revelation and an understanding and a maturing, and all of a sudden we have this attitude that this is what it really means to be with Christ. And we send out, whether knowingly or unknowingly, an air of, well, if you are really following Jesus, this is what you do. Oh, you went and saw that movie? Oh. You know, I was reading this morning. What are you reading? Oh you, you, oh, you don't read your Bible every day? Oh. Hey, man, should I be able to do this to do this? Really? You don't know? <laughs> Am I making sense? Sometimes our language is like you ought to or should rather than you can, and there's an opportunity. You know, you should read your Bible every day. Hey, you know you can read your Bible every day? And when I do, God shows me amazing things. Well, if you're really serious about Christ, you will. See, to the weak, Paul became weak. To not put anybody down, but to lift Jesus up in front of their face. Amen? 
So what's my point? It is, and jot this down in your notes, it is the core of most things is why we do them. The core of most decisions is why. Why was Paul doing the haircut? As a legalism? No. As an opportunity. Why does Waxer wear shorts? Because he has nothing else in his closet? No. But I want all people of Hawaii to know that they are welcome to church. It's not what you wear on the outside, but what's on the inside that matters to Jesus. And so I want to be a missionary in my culture the same way that I was with the Okta people. And so there is a reason. It's not rebellion. It's not, oh, I just come to God as I want. No, no, no. I come to God because he is holy. And you see, recognizing what this means. So now check this out. Because of this, verse 19, it says, And they came, Priscilla and Aquila and Paul, now, and they came to Ephesus, and then he left them there. Now he himself entered where? Into the synagogue. What did he do? Reason. Reason with the Jews. He stuck to the plan. That was the calling that God gave him. A sower goes out to? So. And he would begin first in the synagogue amongst the house of God's people. Verse 20. And when they asked him to stay for a longer time, check it out, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. (laughs) Time out. Paul, can you give me a little refresher? Every time you go into a synagogue, they hate you, they reject you, and they put you before court or they stone you. Here you go before the synagogue and they want to say, they want to learn more and they ask you to stay and you say no. Paul, we need to talk. Something's not right here, Paul. These people were saying, we want to know more and you say no? Oh, church. This is so beautiful for you and I to learn. Many of you here are saints. You've got to learn this. This is a powerful lesson to not only see Paul's strength, Paul's courage, Paul's faith in the midst of his fear, but Paul's obedience. See, some of you, you might have a King James or a New King James, and it actually has a sentence that is not in all of the manuscripts. And so they believe it possibly could have been actually a scribe who wrote it in to explain this. But it will say, but to leave them, he says, I must by all means keep this feast in Jerusalem. See, what we understand is that Paul came to minister to them on his way to Jerusalem to keep the Passover. Two things there. There was a commitment. There was a deadline. There was something that God laid upon his heart that he knew God was wanting him to do, and he would not be turned to the left or the right regardless of how good something might be. Listen, church, this is powerful for us because I would say many of us, if not most of us, are so often need-driven. We see a need, and so we are moved into action because of the need, and we go for it. Our heart sees this need, and we have compassion for it. Therefore, it must be me who is supposed to do something about it. Why? Because, pastor, it's the right thing to do. But let me ask you, have you paused to pray on whether it's the right thing for you to do? See, this is where we need to learn the difference between a good thing and a God thing. Being need-driven and called-driven. And if you and I allow ourselves to be good-driven and need-driven, we will find ourselves exhausted and eventually burn out or actually even bitter. I'm so tired of the church. They just wear you out. They use you every time you go. And da, 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 da. No, 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 beloved. That's because you jumped into everything because you saw the need and it gave you a sense of validation of being able to help somebody because you knew how selfish you are. So you jumped into this. But was it really what God gifted you, what God called you and equipped you to do? Was this God plan or your plan? Now you've got to understand how ludicrous this is for a pastor to be saying this from the pulpit. Because every church is saying, please, we need more people to step up and step out as Paul is in minister. My point is, if you minister, I want you to minister for two things. Number one, God has called you to do it. And secondly, God has gifted you to do it. That's the most important thing. You see, in my second year of ministry, I was 19 years old. I was getting tested for being anemic. I was completely just... Bags into my eyes, and so the church is all concerned, and I've been sick, so they take me to the doctor. No, he's not anemic. He's just worn out. So my mentor pulls me in, and he says, son, there's only one Messiah, and they crucified him. 
Got it, Pastor Bob. See, I thought I had to answer every phone call. Go to every teenager who was having a drama in the middle of the night. Had to run to every need, every center, be at every hospital to pray with every single person because these were legitimate needs. And yes, they are. But guess who sees them? The Father who was in heaven. And I am not the Father. And I had to begin to learn and say, Lord, I need to do more praying before I do serving. Here is a need. Lord, is it I who's supposed to step up? Hey, when I drive by someone on the side of the road and they're hitching, Lord, is it me to pick them up? Is that what you want me to do? Do you want us to have a divine conversation? Or do you have something else for me today? He will let me know. I will have a burning in my heart, pull over. And every time I do, it's awesome. They're either a Christian and I have a great chance to encourage them, or they're somebody who just needs to hear the positive message of a joy-filled Christian, not a, just not a Bible-banging thumper. You know what I'm saying? God always makes it awesome. The question is, is that Paul, here's this church that's saying, oh, we'd love for you to stay. And Paul goes, you know what? I'm a sower. I threw out the seed. I know God is going to bring another person behind me to water because I know what God had called me to do. I need to be obedient. Amen. Some of you got all these people and all these needs and every neighbor and everything. And your husband's saying, do we ever have time together? Can we ever do anything together? That ought to be because we're need-driven rather than God-called. But he says this, I will return to you again, notice, if God wills. Again, something we need to learn. James taught us that in James 4, verse 13. He says, come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we shall go to such and such city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Verse 14, yet you do not know what your life will hold tomorrow. You may get a text message in the morning. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and also do this and that. Look at verse 16. But as it is, you boast and your arrogance, you boast in your arrogance and all such boasting is what? <coughs> yeah, it's not my word. God says when we're saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, he's saying the greatest blasphemy is calling God, God, and then go Godding our life all day long. God is the one who directs. God is the one who makes decisions. God is the one who is sovereign. And yet when we act in those roles, that's called blasphemy. And he says, it's evil. So someone said, hey, I'd love you to come to my party. Hey, that sounds great. I would love to, Lord willing, I'll be there. Hey, would you be involved in this ministry? You know what, that sounds great. I, there's the need. I even have the gifting to new, meet that need. Let me pray about it and make sure this is what God wants. And if it's all together, I'm in. If the Lord wills. Verse 22, and when he had landed in Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church. And he went down to Antioch. Having spent time there, he departed and passed successfully through the Galatian region and Phrygia. Notice, strengthening what? All the disciples. As Paul is on his way to his journey, what does he do? It's right there. Strengthening what? All the disciples. You know what I have written right here in my notes? How would somebody else describe my 2017? If someone was biographing me as Luke is biographizing, nice word, eh? <laughs> biographizing. As Paul, as Luke is writing about Paul, he says, you know what he did? He was strengthening the disciples. What would somebody say about me? Let me turn it the other way. How would someone describe your 2017? See, he was still living his commitment, walking in his calling, but in every elevator, in every line, at Whole Paychecks, I mean Whole Foods, in every place, wherever he was, Paul was strengthening the believers, encouraging, bringing the joy of the Lord. Why? Because, oh, back in verse 9, God said, don't need to be silent. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. I gave you a plan, and he who begins the plan is faithful to complete the plan. Stick to the plan, Paul. And he did. So what do I learn in this today? Well, I learned, first of all, that Paul, even though he's still being challenged, he sticks to the plan. Why? Because he sees God's hand. He actually learned. 
that folks will reap what they sow. So he will later write that to the church of Galatia. He sees Sosthenes and all these guys coming out, and instead Sosthenes gets the beating, and then eventually gets born again. Hallelujah! And those people who thought they were going to be all favored in front of Galileo, they now see themselves in the He sees them as a bunch of whiners, and so it completely backfired on them. He let God, he made room for a miracle to let God be God. Secondly, he remains focused to the calling and the caller. Folks, when God has put something on your heart, remain focused to that calling. But remember, the caller has the right to change the calling at any time, which is why we check in. Why was I ministering in Santa Barbara? God called me. Then why did I leave there and go over to Molokai? God called me. Why did we leave Molokai and come here to Oahu to plant this church? Because God called me to do so. And guess what? When am I leaving this church? When God calls me. I'm not here one second longer than when God, because I've learned when the cloud goes, you better go. Because right under his spout is where his will and his blessing come out. And so Paul is faithful, and we see, oh God, Corinth, great. They hey, did Ephesus. Okay, let's come and minister. Hey, would you stay? You know what? I'd love to, but you know what? The cloud is moving for me. And I'm going to make room for somebody else. Because listen, Christian, we can get in the way of God. I told you earlier about Sosthenes. Many of us sometimes by our heartstrings being pulled to compassion and meeting every need around us, we actually stand in the way of God's process of breaking somebody. He's in fact disciplining them. When they come to you, they come to me. Hey, we're not able to make rent this month and this and that. So on and so hey, can you guys help me out? In the back of my mind, yes, I can help you out. But Lord, should I help them out? Because Lord, is this a process of reaping what they have sown because they have distanced themselves from you and so you cannot bless because he says righteous and I will bless the unrighteous and so you tell me this. And so do I just jump in and by all my wanting to be mama bear or papa bear and help everybody, am I actually blocking the hand of God? Am I inhibiting there? Or is my serving in every position that I see in need now filling it for somebody else who actually is still sitting in the audience going, I'd love to be able to be connected with my church and serve in some way, but it seems like everyone is filled up in the worship team. Everyone is filled up in this and that. And so because people are doing it out of need rather than calling, we're hindering someone else from operating in their gifts. See, it's important that we walk in our calling and we check in with the caller so that we're about God's word, God's will, and... God's way. But what I think I learned the most in this lesson is I see why Paul was so effective. He was so effective because of these three things. Number one, he had a listening ear to the Holy Spirit. Number two, he walked then in obedience to what he heard. And then number three, he was a man of convictions, a man of integrity. He didn't veer to the left or to the right, whether it brought him before the courts or whether he had an audience who wanted to hear more, where he could have received their adulation. He said, you know what? I must be about the Lord's business and not busyness. So let me ask you this question. Has God been trying to get your attention lately? See, like Sosthenes, maybe you are a Christian here today, but things have just not been pono. And you find a restlessness, and again, your life, your marriage, this and that. You feel like your prayers are being hindered and all these things. Well, the Bible tells me in Isaiah, it says that his hand isn't too short or his ear too deaf, but our sin, our iniquities block us from God. Perhaps you've been running around and fighting for yourself and fighting for your vindication that you've not made room for God and you've been playing God. And the Bible says all such boasting of doing things and proclaiming things on your own, that's evil. Are, are, are these things hindering you? And so God has been having to get your attention because you haven't been hearing all the blessings of every love letter and every breath and everything and every sunrise and sunset. So God's saying, you know what? I need to pull back my blessing. If that's you here today, respond to Jesus Christ. Hear, Sosthenes, that God is speaking to you. Let the beating drive you back to your knees and say, Abba, Daddy. B, Luke 11, verse 17. And when he came to his senses, said the prodigal, there's more than enough bread in my father's house. But perhaps today, Sosthenes, you're here and you've just recognized that you've always just been in rebellion against God. And God can't bring the blessing until he's first brought his healing presence. And it's as simple as this. You can respond today by first of all recognizing that God is large and in charge. God created 
And this God has the rules of what is heaven and what is right and what is wrong. Problem is, every single one of us has the sin nature, as we've been speaking about. But God provided. That sin separated me from a holy God, so God himself became the perfect one to give the perfect sacrifice. And for that reason, Jesus gave his life. But now the opportunity is for you to respond. Church, I've shown you this many times. It's that simple to write on a napkin, to simply explain Jesus lives, Jesus loves, Jesus saves. Hey, thank you for spending your time with us today at One Love Ministries and being a part of our program. But this invitation that you heard today through the Word of God is directly to you. And I want you to know if you have not yet made a profession of faith, meaning ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, that invitation is available to you right now. Change, transformation, all the glorious things that God wants to do are available to you, but you gotta ask. You must personally invite Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. So if God has been speaking to you during this message, your heart's been beaten, your hands been cutting kind of sweaty, you've been wrestling with things, guess what? That's the Lord knocking on your heart. And I want to lead you right now in a prayer that can allow you to invite Jesus Christ to become your Lord and Savior and open the door for eternity for you and Him to be together. I want you to pray with me right now. It's not a magic prayer, but an honest heart that will invite the Lord into your life. Join me right now. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask you to forgive me and to become my Lord and Savior. Today, Jesus, I believe that you are God and that you saved me and my faith will be put in you. Please give me your Holy Spirit to come in and upon me that I might learn how to live as a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and today I come home. In your name I pray, amen. If you prayed that prayer with us, we are excited. The Bible says the angels in heaven are rejoicing and we wanna join them too. So would you call this number right here on the bottom of the screen and let us know. We wanna help you find a church that's in your area, get plugged in, get fellowship, get disciple as the Bible says, because we wanna grow in God's grace together. God bless you, he loves you, we're excited. If you would like to receive a copy of today's message, please write down the sermon number on your screen and give us a call at 955-9335. For service times and locations, check us out on the web at onelove.org. Mahalo for watching.